Well, good morning, everyone, and I uh, hope your morning's going well. It's Friday, May the 28th, 2020, and, uh, and welcome to the Quarantine Devotionals. Um, hope, hope that uh, I, you may maybe been outside this morning already and have enjoyed some of this beautiful weather that we're enjoying. I look out at the skies today, and guys, I'll tell you, this is a skydiver's dream. <laughs> These are what you call blue skies, but a little bit of cloud out there. Uh, it's just such a nice day, and I think it's only going to get better. We've had a beautiful week, and I hope that uh, that your week's been a good one. Uh, Weather-wise, it's just been incredible out here on the, on the West Coast. Um, in Ontario, if you're listening in, in from Ontario, man, I know it's been hot there and I miss some of that Ontario heat. I don't miss the Ontario winters, but there was something about that Ontario heat. Boy, it was just sweltering some days, but good days to be out at the beach. Well, I guess that you're stuck right now, though. There's no beach activity going on unless you want to get a fine. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, but anyway, it's it's a it's a good time. So yeah, good morning. Uh, who do we have here this morning already? Well, Sherry, your Phil is faithfully uh, tuned in to what's going on. Barb Hyman, Barb, hi. I hope that you're doing well. Uh, always praying for you, and uh, hope that you're feeling okay. Steve and Sheila McIntyre are in the house, and Terry Spencer. Um, uh, well, I, actually, I don't know if you're still down. I don't think you're in. I think you're still in Arizona, Terry. But we need to be in prayer for them as they get ready to make their way back up to uh, things this time of year. Um, well, guys, let's begin by going to a word of prayer. This is a time of uh, devotions this morning, so let's devote our heart to God, uh, so that we might um, might be open to hear what He has to say this morning. Let's. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, we want to thank you for this time that we are able to meet together like this, even though it's from a distance um, and, you know, we're not really together physically. It's not like church, but, uh, but still, it's a time that we can come together with you at the center of everything. We can spend some time in your word and hear what it is that you might have to say to us this morning. Um, we pray for uh, uh, just for an openness to listen to you. Uh, we pray for change in our lives so that we might be made more like Christ uh, and our minds might be renewed or um, taken out of the ways of our old sinful nature and out of the way of thinking of this world and put into new, a new um frame of reference and that frame of reference is uh, really the image that you created us for when you created us in the beginning we know that when we were saved lord jesus you came to restore us to that and one day you will make all things new we thank you that we get a bit of a jump on that in our lives and in our souls as your spirit works on us and we pray that he would work on us this morning um yeah so we ask that we would do all things today to the glory of you and let it start right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, <clears throat> um, I want to ask you this morning that you would uh, open up your Bibles, open them up to Luke chapter 5, guys. Luke chapter 5. As we're making our way through Luke here, we're uh, seeing all kinds of things happening in the ministry of Jesus. But yeah, Luke chapter 5 this morning. And as you turn there again, I want to uh, tell you about a really, really great book. Um, it's a book that you're going to say, man, I'm not getting that thing. That thing looks way, way too big. But I can guarantee you that if you do, um, you don't have to read it all. The great thing about this book is that uh, you don't have to read it all, but you can look at the chapters for reference as need be. And that book is called Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem. And I know, like I said on Wednesday, I know that this title will put some off, people off right away. Uh, listen, don't judge a book by its cover. Um, actually, I, I like the term systematic theology, but I like theology. I can guarantee you that you will like theology, too, if you get this book. Uh, the book's authored by Wayne Grudem, who's one of the uh, um, world's uh, foremost uh, Christian theologians. There's a lot of theologians out there, but um, many, uh, unfortunately, don't teach Christian teaching, but Wayne Grudem is rock solid 
He's a good guy. Um, and he has put together this book. He's put it together for you. He's put this book together for the everyman. This is not a book that is aimed at academics. It's book that it's aimed at, uh, at everyday people, just like you and me. And so it's very readable, very understandable, and it's very practical as well. He has a lot of practical things in here for just living out your faith on a day-by-day -day basis. But he answers all kinds of different questions. Um, so some of the... Uh, uh, some of the topics that he covers. First of all, the Word of God. Um, what are the different forms of the Word of God? The canon of Scripture, what does that mean? He gets into um, what God is like. How do we know Him? He looks at the character of God and, and, uh, what, and you know, what makes God God. Talks has a chapter on the Trinity, has a chapter on creation, and there's all kinds of things um, uh, that you'll find very interesting and very practical. So, Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem. Now, it is a big book, so if you're, if you're uh, wanting something a little bit smaller, he does have an abridged version here, and it's called Bible Doctrine. And basically, it's the same book. All that he's done is he's just made the chapters a little bit shorter. Um, so you could get this book as well. If you're not feeling like you want to uh, get this one, that's, it's killing my arm right now as I hold it up. Um, you can get this one here and you know what you can curl this all day long as you read it and get it to shape um, so two great books by Wayne Grudem um, if you want to he's got tons of good stuff on YouTube too, just little clips and things like that and lectures um, so Google Wayne Grudem and you won't be disappointed with what you hear him uh, speaking about he's a great teacher uh, He's not a super dynamic teacher, but boy, the stuff he has is really great. So, Luke chapter 5. <clears throat> and this morning we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. So, a lot of times I'll read the whole chapter, but this morning we'll just read uh, the first 11 verses. So, it says this, Luke chapter 5, starting at verse 1. As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by Lake Gennesaret. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. Then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, We've worked hard all night long and caught nothing, but at your word, I'll let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, because I'm a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they took. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. Then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. Well, this is an interesting passage because it's in this passage this morning that we meet someone that we're going to read about through the rest of the Bible, and that is Peter, also known as Simon. Um, in verse 8, it says Simon Peter, just so that we really know who this guy is. But Peter would go on to become one of the most instrumental and one of the most important people in the Bible, writing some books himself, actually, but being used greatly by God to do uh, not only lead people to Christ, but to lead his church as well. So, um, <clears throat> a few things that I want to notice here. And the first one is the way that Jesus taught. We notice in this text here that he didn't just teach one person here. He taught more than one person. And I think one of the things that we can pick up on is that uh, we need to become all things to all people. So that uh, Paul actually says this in one of his letters, become all things to all people so that by every means some might be saved. And that's what you and I need to do. We need to become all things to all people so that by every means some might be saved. 
Look at verses 1 to 3, and we see the people that Jesus was teaching in verses 1 to 3. He was teaching a, a general crowd of people up on the land. But then in verses 4 to 7, it moves to teaching Peter. He's not just teaching people in general anymore. He's teaching Peter. And these were two different types of people that he was teaching. Um, there were people who received and were ready to receive more plain and uh, in general instruction. But then there were people that required another way of being taught as well. And one of the things that this shows us is that Jesus, Jesus wasn't just called to one type of people to teach. He was called to all kinds of people. And he went out uh, to teach all kinds of people. And Jesus' different teaching produced disciples no matter what camp he went out to teach people in. Um, if you look at verses 8 to 11, we see Peter's reaction to Jesus' teaching. Uh, and it's one that humbled him, and it's one that led him to, uh, to follow Christ. If we look at other sections where Jesus is teaching a general and a larger crowd, there were many people from those crowds that followed Christ. The point is, is that Jesus went to all kinds of people, uh, and, and, uh, and he became uh, all things to all people, so that by every means some might be saved. You know what? You and I need to do the same. But that requires something of us. It requires us to, uh, to be learners of people, to understand people, so that you are able to meet them where they're at, so that I'm able to meet them where they're at. It's one of the things that I aim for in my sermons. I, don't, I want them to be somewhat academic and somewhat learned so that people can understand them. At the same time, it's my hope and it, it's my desire that even if the town drunk walks in off the street, that he's able to understand every word that's being said. But we need to, understand, we need to uh, learn how to relate to people for the sake of their souls. You know, if we are um, re faithfully uh, speaking about Jesus to people and faithfully reaching out to people, we will not always, in fact, seldom, uh, it, 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 will it be easy to teach them about Jesus or to tell them about Jesus. We won't just have easy people to teach all the time, people who are in our social strata, people that uh, we relate to easily. We'll have people who are oftentimes more difficult to teach. You know, if you are from a crowd that is uh, maybe more educated, um, maybe you've always lived in relative wealth and, and, uh, and uh, that, that sort of environment, that's going to be very easy for you to speak to people like that because you get them. But you turn to a crowd that may be homeless or maybe from a different uh, social strata than you, a different country perhaps, different side of the town, that's outside of your comfort zone. I know it is for me, but you know what? We need to learn and understand where they're coming from so that uh, we are able to teach them. Sometimes people are just going to be plain difficult to teach. You know, uh, these are the kind of people that's going to require something of you to reach. And that's going to require, first of all, it's going to require patience. It's going to require a lot of patience. Like when we look at Jesus here, um, it didn't require a lot of patience for him to maybe teach that general crowd. He would stand up in front and teach them. But then he turns to Peter, and there was some time involved here. He had to get out in that boat, help him get ready to put out again. They says they, they had already washed their nets. You can bet Jesus didn't just uh, uh, not help them put those nets out. He probably did. Um, and it would have required at least a few hours probably to be with Peter and these guys. Guys, that requires patience on our part in order to, um, uh, in order to reach people. It requires creativity. Jesus taught the crowd one way. He taught Peter a whole different way. It was an object lesson that he taught Peter here. He, had, he, he, uh, he, he reached him through what Peter knew about fishing. You and I need to be creative in the way that we reach people. All of this requires time. It requires effort. It requires patience. But you know what? We need to become all things to all people so that by every means, some might be saved. That's the life God calls you to. Second thing I want to notice about this text here is that when we look at Peter, we see that all that's required is a little bit of faith to follow Jesus all that's required of you and I, 
right, is just a little bit of faith to follow him. We look at the faith of Peter here. Now we know from these opening verses that Peter wasn't just an ordinary fisherman. He was an expert fisherman. It says in, uh, uh, in verse 3 that Jesus got into one of the boats which belonged to Simon, which belonged to Peter. So <clears throat> in order to own your own boat, you would have to know something about fishing. He had hired hands to help him. And so when Jesus tells Peter to let down the nets, Peter knows full well that there's nothing to be caught there. He has been out there. Verse 5 says that, Peter says, we've labored all day long. And he knows there's nothing out there to be caught. But Jesus told him to let down the nets, and Peter was open to listen to Jesus. Most fishermen wouldn't have done this. But Peter was open to hear Jesus. And not only did he hear Jesus, but he was obedient when he heard Jesus. It's no small task to let down those nets. If you've seen the fishing boats out here in Port Townsend or where I grew, grew up in Ontario, they were big fishing boats out there all the time. Those nets aren't small little things. They had just washed them, and now they, was gonna, they were going to put them down again. You know what? Peter was obedient to do that. <clears throat> all Peter needed was a little bit of faith for Jesus to do what he wanted to do with him. And it's the same with you and I. Guys, we don't need to have monumental faith. We are not all the Apostle Paul. We're not the William Carey's. We're not the George Whitfield's. Look, we're just not these monumental men of faith. But here's the thing. I think if you lived in their minds, they wouldn't think they were either. All they had was a little bit of faith, just like Peter. And all you need and I need is just a little bit of faith for God to use us. Jesus said, all you need is faith as small as a mustard seed, and moving mountains will be possible. You know, oftentimes our judgment, just like Peter, is going to say, this isn't going to work, or this makes no sense to do this. God's telling me to do this or pushing me to do this, but it doesn't make any sense. This goes against everything in me. It goes against my better judgment. You know what? Lay that aside. Lay that aside. Because God is a worker of miracles. First of all, just take the time to listen to God. That's the first thing that we need to do. Spend some time in prayer. After the devotions this morning, spend some more time in prayer. Spend time in God's word. And you know what? We've taken that step of faith just a little bit this morning to even be here for these devotions, to know that this is important, that we take time to hear God's word. So do those things. Uh, when God pushes you to do something, if you don't know how, seek other Christian counsel to see how this might be. But, you know, listen to God. Hear what he has to say to you. And then, just like Peter, don't just listen. Be obedient and try it. Be obedient and do what God is pushing you to do. You see, all God needs to work it, great things through you is just a little bit of faith to follow him. And if we have that faith, man, you're going to see God do things in your life. Mm-hmm. Peter had a little bit of faith, and God worked this miracle. Just hit you, just have a little bit of faith, and I just have a little bit of faith, and we'll see God work, work miracles. The third thing I want to notice is that, uh, is, you know, God has given you everything that you need to do his will. He's given us everything that we need to do his will. You know, Jesus turns Peter here from an ordinary fisherman, uh, who li- a man who lived to f- feed himself, a man who lived to provide for himself. He turns Peter into a man who lived to save others. Look at verses 10 to 11. At the end of verse 10, uh, it tells us that um, uh, they were amazed at the catch of fish that they took, and Jesus told Peter, don't be afraid. Uh, From now on, you'll be catching people. Then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. Here we see a total change of direction in Peter's life, a complete change of mission for him, what he lived for. Before, he lived to survive for himself. He lived to feed for himself. If we look at Peter's behavior, uh, if you've been watching that series on The Chosen that I recommended last week, a great series that you should check out, you I think you really get a sense of who Peter was. He was an aggressive guy. He took the bull by the horns. 
and, uh, and he had no problem uh, living for himself and providing for himself. But Jesus changes him here from that kind of self-centered man to a man who becomes an evangelist, a man who lives for the sake of others knowing God. He has a total change of priorities here. Look at verse 11. They brought the boats into land, <laughs> this big fishing boat that Peter owned. It says, he left everything and followed him. You want to talk about a change of priorities. This was everything in Peter's life. Well, he leaves it all to follow Jesus. You know, that day, Jesus changed Peter from a self-centered man who lived to save himself to a man who lived to save others. And if you are a Christian, Jesus has done the exact same work in you. He has taken you from that old way of life to a new way of life that no longer seeks things for yourself, but a life that seeks God's glory and seeks to see other people live in God's glory. He's made you into someone who is, who, who's supposed to go out and to minister Jesus and to speak Jesus to other people. You know, we might think that uh, this isn't me. I'm not sure if I'm called to be an evangelist, but we know that every single one of us, if you're a Christian, you are called to be an evangelist. Matthew 28, 19, and you'll hear me read this over and over and over again, because I think this is to be our focus. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. You know what? That is your call, just as, it, as much as it's mine, just as much as it was Peter's. That is your call and my call. Because we're equipped now to be evangelists by the power of God's Holy Spirit that lives in you. Well, you hear that word evangelist and you think, I'm not called to be an evangelist. You know, I, I'm not called to get up and be the next Billy Graham. I'm not called to go into the streets and, and, uh, and, and preach forth the word to hundreds of people. You know, that is not always what an evangelist is. There's many different ways that you can be an evangelist. And God gives every person different gifts. The Holy Spirit apportions those gifts as he sees fit. There may be other ways for you to be an evangelist. You're, you're, you like cooking? Well, then cook something and have someone over. And then in the course of that conversation, speak Jesus to them. Are you an artist? Well, you know what? Paint things that glorify God and speak the message of salvation through painting. You're a singer, same thing. Maybe you're really good with finances or accounting or uh, computer programming or things like that. Use those things to reach people with the gospel. You are an evangelist, but some of those you know, stereotypical evangelist uh, ways, that's just not the way that the Holy Spirit's gifted you, but he's gifted you to be an evangelist. We're called to be different types of evangelists depending on those gifts. But I guess the question we need to ask here, looking at verse 11, is are you willing to leave everything behind, all of your life priorities? It doesn't mean you leave your house behind or your car behind or your children behind or your dog or cat. What it means is that you're willing to leave everything that you've lived for behind in order to reach people with the gospel. Your ambitions, your drives, those things that bring you uh, security, finding your security then. Even, maybe even losing the friendship of friends or losing family member relationships so that you can be the evangelist that God has called you to be. Are you willing to leave those things behind? I don't think Peter sold his fishing boat. I think it just means that Peter left that behind to follow Jesus. He probably came back and he used that later on to support himself, but he, he, he left those things to follow Jesus right then. Are you willing to do that? To leave behind all of these other things that have driven you, all of these other things that maybe you think can bring you happiness or pleasure, to follow Jesus and do what he wants you to do. And if you are, well, then praise God. Praise God, because it will require patience. It will require work, but become all things to all people so that by every means you might see some saved. You guys, all we need is a little bit of faith, a little bit of faith to follow Jesus. 
and recognize that he's given you everything that you need to do his will. Now, go out and be that, uh, be that evangelist that God called you to be with those gifts that he's given you to do that. That is how we follow him. That is how we're obedient to him. Well, just a few thoughts. And God may have uh, pointed out some other things to you through this text as well. Always be careful to make sure that you're staying within what uh, Luke intended for you to hear. That's very important that you're not drawing out weird things from the text that, or importing things into the text. But I pray that some of these thoughts might resonate with you this morning. If you haven't had the courage or you had some doubt about your ability to uh, be a witness to others, doubt no more. He's given you what you need. Well, Christ is the owner of your heart if you're a believer. So let him own all of you. And if you're listening this morning, and I don't think there's anyone tuned in who's not a Christian, maybe there is, but if you're listening this morning and you haven't put your trust in Jesus, you want to know God, you want to live a life that, uh, sorry, got a sore knuckle here. Um, you want to live a life that, uh, that follows him, just like Peter followed him, so that you can be right with God and know his peace. Well, now is the time. Now is the time to ask him to change your life. Confess your sins to him. Say, God, I know that you're calling me. I know that you want me for yourself. And just let him into your heart and follow him. And uh, if you need help with that, well, you know what, contact me or talk to another Christian. Um, but, uh, but now is the time to follow him. For the rest of you who are Christian, guys, have a great day. Let's just be faithful and do what he wants us to do and have the faith to do that. It's good to see all of you again this morning. Let's close with a word of prayer and then we'll just continue on with our days. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for what you said to us this morning. It's uh, nothing new, and uh, it's just things that we need to be reminded of, that you can do anything through those that, um, uh, that you've called to be your children. You've equipped us all in different ways, but we all have the same power of the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit through whom Peter and John the same spirit that drove Jesus to do his work, Lord. It's been placed within us. And we pray that, uh, that we would be obedient and follow you, faithful witnesses, because the gospel is a powerful thing to change lives, not just for a short time, but for eternity. God, give us that conviction. Give us that compassion to see the lost saved. But above all, give us a desire to see your name praised on the lips of people who don't know you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, hope that you have a great day. Um, we want to remind you uh, to, to uh, take advantage of the services that are being live streamed, whether it's at our church or whether it's at, at another church that's close to you or your church. Don't miss that Sunday morning. It's a little discouraging sometimes to know that there are people who are just missing out on church altogether, but take advantage of that. For San Juan Baptist Churchers, um, follow your emails because it looks like uh, maybe even next week we'll be, we might be open for church. We're going to discuss that today as elders, and that will be a wonderful, wonderful thing. We're very eager to get back, but keep your eye on your emails, um, and, uh, and we'll see churches maybe opening up uh, sooner than we had hoped for. God bless and have a great weekend, a great Sunday morning, and we'll do this again next Wednesday morning. Bye for now.